All right, how's it going? Yay. Four out of ten. Four. Uh, sign in sheet. So, um, I updated the PA2 assignment. I added an additional note just for anybody who's who stumbled across this. Um, in the assignment, it says that the list of locations should be printed as a space separated list, and in the sample output, it shows a comma separated list. So you can do either um, spaces or commas. So you already did commas, I know. <laughs> How goes PA2? So are you feeling like, you know, you're going to be able to do this? Do you understand the process? Or is it kind of feeling like a big flood coming towards you and you're not sure how to break this down? Something in between. So part of of the assignments in, in this course, um, and part of the reason why I'm not doing ODPs this quarter, is to get you to a place where you're more comfortable sort of working with these larger projects. Um, when you move on to a university after Clark, right, typically you might get a programming assignment where the specification is 10 or 15 or 20 pages long. It just goes on and on and on. It's like, here's what you got to do, but here's some details, and here's some more details, and here's more details about the details. Um, and this is pretty typical, right? The, the kinds of projects you'll be taking on at a university or in a workplace, or if you're doing something on your own, can get really large in scope. And an important skill is being able to take something that's, you know, a huge behemoth and whittle it down in a way that makes it manageable for you or for you and your team members or whoever. Um, and so that's part of what, what's going on with these assignments. They are larger assignments, um, but they can be broken down into pieces. Um, and there's, there's two challenges, I guess. One is while you're learning this stuff, right, breaking it into pieces that are the right size so you can learn it. Um, so. You know, if you're new to objects and object-oriented programming, um, you know, you want to make some small classes first to get, get used to the syntax and the concepts and so on. But even if you're totally familiar with Java, you've been doing Java for, for years, um, a large project still needs to be broken into manageable pieces, right, just for the sake of being able to do it. And that's part of what you want to get some practice with in this course and your other courses is is doing that partitioning and so this is this is where I keep harping on things like modularization and putting things into functions or methods or objects in this case um, testing things as you go um, building wrappers around things and so on and so forth so um, that's probably the most important part in my mind of, of working on this project is breaking it down in a way that, that works for you. Because um, I mean we've put linked list code on the board and we've, we've looked at it and you've done it in other courses. Um, I think if I said, you know, here's two weeks, build me a program that takes integers and puts them into a linked list in Java, Guarantee everybody could do that, right? The trick here is that's one piece of PA2. And, and so there's, there's being able to make that piece, but there's also thinking about how that piece is going to fit into a larger picture. And then there's the mechanics of knowing how to take that division and make it work in Java, right? And that's, that's what objects are about. So being able to take the notion of a linked list and actually put it in its own class, in this case a location list class, and think about what methods do we want in there. I've said put a method called add to end, right, which tacks an integer onto the end of the list, but why are you doing that besides the fact that I suggested it, right? Um, how are you going to use that in stuff that's incorporating a location list? Um, <coughs> How are you going to use the methods in the word list inside your index utility? 
And so sort of without doing any actual coding, you definitely want to spend some time at the start of any project and periodically throughout the project sort of building a mental map, right, not just mental but on paper maybe in some way that describes, you know, here's my main program and it's calling this and this and that. And this and this and that are each, this is what they look like and this is the things that they're calling. And sort of figuring out what do I need to expose in these classes? What parts of this object do I need to manipulate from something that's creating it and, and using it? And it's, it's largely just an organizational challenge more than a programming challenge, right? Although that's you know, a big part of programming is the organization. <coughs> so if you're feeling kind of stumped or kind of like you know, you've gone so far and you're not sure where to go from here, um, Try taking a step back, and this is totally, you know, a really, really good thing to be talking about with friends, with, uh, you know, the discussion area on Canvas, um, in class, obviously, or office hours, but this is, this is really good for, like, groupthink, right? So I don't understand how I add something to the end of the location list, right? That's a great conversation to have. Um, so you can, you can definitely work with each other on sort of these organizational aspects and, and trying to figure out how you're going to use these classes. Yeah? Um, you didn't mention the, uh, in the instructions, were we allowed to use the functions like to lowercase? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, it should say something in there about using the string class or something, but yeah, uh, stuff from the string class, um, you know, is letter and all the stuff from a scanner and, and if you want to use split for some reason, all that stuff, totally fair game. Just make sure you're writing your own list code. That's the only thing I really don't want you to take from, right? Or if there's a word <coughs> index class already, don't use that. So any other questions around all of that? Yeah. Um, for compare to is the only thing you need. Okay. So this is important for alphabetizing. Don't build your list and then at the very end when you're ready to print it, try to sort it. Okay, that's really less efficient and it's likely to blow up on War and Peace and other things. Um, keep your list sorted at all times by simply when you're inserting a new word in your list, insert it in the right spot. Just like we did with integer lists in 222. Find where it goes between two nodes and put your new node there. Um, and I mentioned in the, the suggested steps, that's something you can do at the very end. If you're putting your new word at the end or the beginning of the list, right, that's fairly straightforward to code. But your list is not going to be alphabetized. So what do you do at the very end? You're ready to turn in, but you've got to somehow have your list alphabetized. Just change that insert function. The thing that goes through your word list and, and inserts a node at the beginning or end, go through, find the right spot to insert it. And bingo, your list is alphabetized. And the way to know where it belongs, you use the compare to method in the string class. So compare to is like string comp gives you positive, negative, or zero, depending on the sense of the two strings. And as usual, you know, if you're not sure how to use compare to, write some test code. Right? You can read the documentation in the Java doc, but it's it's more clear, I think, to actually write some code and see what it does. Um, so if you're not sure which string compares to which, or is it positive if it becomes before or after, right? write a test main program and just play with that. And junk code is good because it gets you more practice at putting together a class, public static void main, all that kind of stuff. I think your midterm's in like two weeks, by the way. So. <laughs> Which I just like noticed the other day. It's like, oh, I'm gonna have to write that. You still have to notice that. Yeah. You still have to notice that. You don't, because I just told you. <laughs> <laughs> Did not register. Okay. That means we're like halfway through the course after next week. So I spent a good part of yesterday fighting with some IDEs. 
Um, I was trying to do some things in IntelliJ and just getting more and more frustrated. So if you get frustrated with IntelliJ, you know, you're not alone. Um, and finally I was like, forget it, we're just going to do NetBeans. So I actually posted an announcement on Canvas with a delayed release saying, you know, download NetBeans, we're going to do that this week. And I started trying to simulate what your experience would be downloading NetBeans and installing it, and NetBeans isn't there anymore. They've like updated to Apache NetBeans, and it's a mess as far as I can tell. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. If you know how to use it, I'm sure it's fantastic. But um, the old version of NetBeans, like up through version 8, was just kind of like, it was there to help you, but it didn't like get in your way, it didn't impose anything on you. So you could write Java code the way you always do it. You could drag things over and drop them to like build a GUI and so on and so forth. And it would just do what you asked it to do. Um, and IntelliJ feels more like it's trying to, to be understood by you and then get you to do things according to the way it wants things done. And that seems to be what NetBeans or Apache NetBeans is doing now also. So I don't know if we're actually going to mess around with NetBeans because I think it's kind of on par with IntelliJ as far as, as what it imposes on you. So we're back to IntelliJ, um, and I deleted that announcement before it posted. Um, but I struggled more with IntelliJ overnight and this morning and, and have more happiness with it. So maybe I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, I don't know. Um, but we'll stick with IntelliJ for now. So I promised we were going to talk about graphics this week. Um, and not all of this you necessarily need to know to do graphics with Java, but, um, but I don't want Java to be mysterious or too magical. Um, so let's talk about graphics. So. You have a display, and you want to draw a picture. Let's say you want to draw a rectangle, which happens to look like a square. Um, so how many people have, have ever used a TV set with an actual like picture tube inside? cathode ray tube. And you know it's got a CRT inside because when you turn it on it actually takes a little while to warm up. And when you turn it off often it takes a while to cool down. When you cut the power sometimes the image like sh shrinks down to a little dot and that little dot persists in the middle for a few seconds. Um, and it draws a lot of power and if it's an old style one that was made with vacuum tubes, right, you could look in the back and you'd see this orange glow coming from the components inside. And it would just draw a lot of power. And when I was a kid, you know, we were warned to like stay at least 15 feet back from the screen because of what it puts out. And with color TVs especially, it was like, you know, stay back 20 feet or something like that. Um, until the parents leave the room and then you sit down right in front of it, right? <laughs> For some reason, when I started working in, in computers, I was encouraged to sit this close to my monitor, even though it was still a CRT. <laughs> but, um, so, so how do those CRTs work? Um, it's a, a worthwhile thing to think about because it's, it's still a model that is in place even though you know, modern displays don't actually have a CRT or an electron beam. We still have the same sort of uh, model of making a display work. So, side view, 
get some of my horrifying graphics now. Side view of a CRT was something like this. Big vacuum, right? Curved surface in the front. Um, however big your display is. And at the back end of this, there's something that emits electrons. So typically a piece of metal that gets heated up. So this is part of where the high power requirements come from. Heats up and when you heat up metal, it spits out electrons. And electrons just kind of fly all over the place, right? No particular direction. Um, but you have a pair of plates that you can use to basically create a field. And that field will cause the electrons to move either in this direction or in that direction. All right, so you put some kind of filter here so you just have a, a fine beam of electrons coming out. And by applying a, a voltage, either plus minus or plus minus on these plates, you can cause this beam to deflect up or down. And depending on how you deflect the beam, it will hit the surface of this glass tube at some point. If you're pulling it up, it'll hit it up there. If you're pushing it down, it'll hit down here. If you have that field balanced, it'll hit right in the middle. And so picture a garden hose that you can direct up or down, right? So you can light anywhere along a vertical line on the wall. And then you have a second pair of plates, orthogonal to the first, which you can use to steer the beam left or right. So by controlling those two plates, right, you can basically steer this beam anywhere over this two-dimensional surface, which is the inside of the TV screen. And the inside of the screen is coated with a phosphor that lights up when it gets hit with charged particles and creates a little dot. And the dot fades pretty quickly, but your eye-brain combination sees that dot as, as something persistent for a little while. And now imagine that you can turn this electron beam on and off. And if you cut the power to this thing, the electron beam disappears. If you apply power, it turns on. So now you run a pattern. So let's go to the front of the screen. You apply a pattern to those horizontal and vertical deflectors so that your beam starts in the upper left and moves over to the right and then swings back and moves over but on the next line down and swings back and moves over on the next line down and so on until it gets to the lower right and then it swings all the way back up to the top left and it starts over again. And by turning the beam on and off in the right positions, you can make images appear. So you always turn the beam off when it's sweeping back or when it's sweeping up to the upper left corner. And in the case of our rectangle, beam is off, beam is off, beam is off. You turn the beam on when it's right here, leave it on until it gets here turn it off. On the next line, you leave it off until it gets here, turn it on, turn it off immediately, wait till the beam gets over here, turn it on, turn it off, and you keep doing that. And you're really lighting a whole bunch of little individual dots, right? So it's what we call pixels. And your brain sees those dots and puts them together into lines and curves and shapes. And then if they change over time, it looks like motion and, and your brain smooths that out and you've got movies. So there's no electron beam, obviously, in a laptop or you know a flat panel display. Um, but there's still this notion of um, getting to the end of a line and coming back to the beginning and getting to the bottom right and going back to the upper left. And if you we're to tap into the signals through a VGA cable, right? There's a signal for red, one for green, one for blue. There's a vertical sync signal. There's a horizontal sync signal. 
and those correspond to this sweeping pattern. All right, so the horizontal sink is when it comes back to the left, the vertical sink is when it goes from bottom to top. And those are generated and the hardware inside, you know, flat panel display interprets them to know which pixels to light up and darken. Um, so it's still a model that's useful to refer to. So that's handled by hardware. And you might have a cathode ray tube, you might have a flat panel display, a plasma display, you might have, um, you know, VR goggles, um, lots of different technologies in there. But as usual, the goal is that we don't need to understand the details of the hardware to be able to work with it. So part of what's happening with a JVM or with any windowing system with X11 or anything else is that specific for the type of hardware that you're interacting with, there's code. But the way that you interact with that code is standard. So we can write Java code which says I want to draw a rectangle in the middle of the screen and that code's going to work pretty much on any kind of display. Because there's a layer below the code that we're writing that knows about, you know, I need to send out a horizontal sync signal on pin 9 of this connector or I need to do something else or this is an HDMI signal so I need to do this. Um, that's handled by a different level. And this is kind of like abstract data types, right? You wouldn't have, you wouldn't want to have to rewrite all your code because somebody's using an HDMI display now instead of a VGA, or a 4K display instead of uh, instead of a lower resolution. So we see a fixed interface to the graphics system, and something else takes that and makes it work with the hardware. So there's a graphics package in Java called AWT, Abstract Windowing Toolkit. And we don't really interact with AWT directly. We're going to work with something higher level. And the main class we're going to want to work with is called graphics. And it's part of AWT. And there's also a graphics 2D, which has some extra things to it. And we'll just glance at some of the things that we can do once we have a graphics class. So um, clearing a rectangular area by filling it in with the background color, drawing a rectangle, drawing a 3D rectangle, drawing an arc of a circle, um, copying one area to another, um, taking an array of bytes and drawing information from that array, drawing images, which could come from something like a JPEG file, um, drawing ovals, polygons, rectangles, rectangles with rounded corners, strings, because if you want to display words on a graphics display, you can't just say printf, because printf doesn't work with this scanning line, right? You got to know when to turn on and turn off the pixels to make the letter A or the letter B. So draw string will handle that for you. Um, filling all of these shapes, so filled polygons, filled rectangles, because that's a hard problem in some ways. If you have a random looking shape, how do you know which pixels to turn on and off if you want to fill the inside of that? Are all these ran on the CPU or are they any of them like done with like a rasterization shader on the GPU? Really good question. Um, and I don't know, but I would hope that certainly these were using hardware support where it was available. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know what, the, what that mechanism looks like. Um, but yeah, if you have a GPU card, hopefully this is using some of the hardware in there. So how many people are familiar with GPUs? Right, so graphics is, is one of the big drivers for computer tech. Um, games in particular, and offloading a lot of the computation involved in doing all of this, this rendering um, onto custom hardware is a big time saver. 
So GPUs are just specialized CPUs that are good at doing the things you need to do to draw shapes, fill shapes, um, do hidden surface removal, add shadows to 3D objects with light sources, and so on and so forth. Um, those are all dedicated functions, but you do them so much in things like games that moving it off to hardware speeds things up. So, um, to be able to use these things, we want to know a bit more about um, pixels. So X runs horizontally, Y runs vertically. Zero, zero always starts in the upper left. That takes a while to get used to. Um, but that's almost always where the origin is, is upper left instead of lower left. And all this stuff is usually done with integers because we're basically counting pixels. So your screen is broken into a discrete collection of cells. And so let's just go VGA. So 640 by 480 really low resolution. So 480 pixels across, uh, sorry, 640 pixels across, 480 from top to bottom. Upper left corner is 00, zero. lower right corner would be 639, 479. And at some level, what you can do is, is turn these pixels on or off, make them visible or invisible. And certainly your underlying hardware knows how to do that. If I say turn on pixel 10 comma 10, it should make a dot visible right here. 10 spots over, 10 spots down. And if you want to draw a line from 10 10 to 20 10, there may be hardware support for that. Or you can say, draw a line from 10, 10 to 20, 10, and it will figure out by itself, I need to light up all these pixels. Or you may have to do it yourself. You may have to say, light up pixel 10, 10, 11, 10, 12, 10, 13, 10, all the way up to 20, 10. And you turn on those 11 pixels, and there's your line. And it used to be you could take a whole course in, in th these kind of computer graphics mechanics and learn things like if you want to draw a line from one point to another, exactly which pixel should you light? Because someone's got to decide that. It might be you, it might be the hardware. But ultimately, you got to turn this into individual pixels. And so typically, your line looks something like this. And so this is rasterizing. These lines that are being swept, these are called raster lines. So this is rasterizing when you face the reality that this diagonal line isn't actually a diagonal line, it's really a staircase with the same slope as your diagonal line. Right, but it's got all these little jaggedy things in there. And on some systems, if you draw a line that's almost horizontal but not quite, it's going to come out like this. If this right thing has a y value that's off by 1 from the initial y value, it's basically a horizontal line, a little jump, and another horizontal line. And you can see that. Right? So, so lines that are 45 degrees are going to come out looking really nice because you just increase x and y. The more horizontal you get, or the more vertical you get, the more you see this jaggediness. And that's, that's called rasterization. And it looks kind of clunky, unless you're playing Minecraft, then it's cool. Um, and so, so you use tricks, like, like filling in some of the pixels around here to add some blur, right? This is what the TV industry does with close-ups. Um, make things blurry, take out these edges, so that's called anti-aliasing. 
right? And it's a technique to make your brain think that the line looks smooth, even though it's still jaggedy and it's got extra stuff in there too, but you can convince your brain that like this is a nice, normal looking diagonal line. And that stuff is handled by the hardware or something in the, the graphic system. Sometimes you just have the option of turning on or off anti-aliasing. Um, it's not something we typically do, but you could. So pretty much all graphical displays today work like this, XY pixels, um, with a notable exception, which is a vector display. And vector displays aren't very common anymore, um, but they were big in the 80s um, as experimental systems. And a vector display works totally differently. A vector display, remember, you've got this electron beam, and you can steer it. These are analog signals you're putting into here. So we can really direct this beam to anywhere that we want on the surface within the precision of probably the width of the beam or the voltage step of a single electron or whatever your favorite discretization is. But we can steer this beam directly to a particular spot. And if we slowly change this field and slowly change that field with some sort of continuous functions, we can cause that beam to move in whatever way we like. And if we feed a sine wave into here and a cosine wave into there, this beam is going to draw out a perfect circle. And it's not going to be rasterized. The rasterization is in effect because we're deliberately breaking this into discrete components on the surface, these pixels, right? But the underlying hardware of something with a cathode ray tube can actually draw these diagonal lines, circles, curves, things like that perfectly. And it's a totally different game to try to control that and to use that to draw images, but, um, but you get beautiful output. So there were some video games in the 80s that used this. Um, I think the Star Wars game used a vector display. And it just looked fundamentally different from all the other ones because it wasn't digitized. And so you didn't get that rasterizing. You can do this with an oscilloscope, by the way. If you go in the scopes in the collaboratorium, they have two inputs. You can set the display to do this. You can put it in XY mode. And basically, the two inputs control where the beam is positioned. And you can you know, display circles and spinny things and stuff like that. Um, with those scopes. I need to do that for 250 someday. All right, so the other thing we need to talk about is color. Um, and color models for graphics displays are usually based on red, green, and blue. So if you're mixing light, your primary colors are red, green, and blue. It's different if you're mixing pigments. Um, and typically, there's a single byte specifying the intensity of these. So 256 different levels for red and for green and for blue. You put those three bytes together, you've got 24 bits per pixel that basically specifies the mix of each of these three lights. And so different combinations give you different colors. If you mix red and green in equal amounts, you get yellow. And if you mix red and blue in equal amounts, you get purple. And so when you look at those color tables and you see those six character hex numbers, right, this is what it's referring to. So when you see a, a color and it's marked, um, right, FF00FF, FF, that's hex. This means 255 for red, zero for green, 255 for blue. That's a solid purple. And so we still use this. Um, in, in a lot of our graphics, but again, it's sort of buried inside other, uh, other layers for us. So if we want to make something red, we can say red, uppercase or lowercase, um, and it'll translate it. Anybody here played with uh, like NeoPixel LED strips, individually addressable? I know some SLPs have been doing this. Um, if you play with those, you're very much doing this. You have 256 levels for each of your three lights, um, each of your three components of, of each LED.
So one of the things we can do with graphic is we could say set color, and it takes an object of type color. So color is a whole class in itself. And it's got some, some static definitions like black, blue, cyan, dark gray, green, light gray, and so on and so forth. So we can always use those, but we can also construct a color, in this case using three integers for red, green, and blue in the value 0 to 255 range. You can use floating points from 0 to 1, and that's just scaling 0 to 255 accordingly, um, and so on. And then color has methods like make a darker version of this current color. So to make something darker, you can just subtract something from the red, green, blue components, but you probably want to subtract something proportional. But colors don't always, our brains don't respond the same way to red, green, and blue. So if you just scale everything back proportionally, one color may start to be more dominant. And so you can take things like that into account. And so there's all kinds of stuff here. All right, so that's, that's a bit of the background um, and stuff that, that we're going to be using to do graphics. Um, and for Java, we're going to rely on this graphics class. But this is a place where we need to understand how Swing is displaying things, and we need to work within that system. Because we don't have the option of simply saying, let's make a display and let's use the graphics class and paint a rectangle and put it in the middle. Um, because when we run a dialogue, as they're called in here, um, there's a lot of stuff going on. And we have to work within that framework. So let me make a, a sample dialogue. Um, So we'll do right click new dialog. I'll get rid of these default buttons. So we run this, and here's our window. And we can do some graphics in this window. We can draw some rectangles and some ovals and things like that. right? But we've got to be careful about where we write this code to do this, because um, we can't just construct a graphics object and start drawing. So let's go to our form. Let's get rid of these things. And I'm going to put down a button. And I'm going to put down a J panel. And if I put that J panel right here, that's the thing that I'm going to do some drawing in. And let's put a border on here. It's sort of more visible. All right, and so there's our panel, and there's our button. And we'll we'll dig into this more later, but there's things that you can set. So remember, there's properties for each widget. So if I click on the button, here's the properties for the button. If I click on the panel, there's properties here. And there's things like, um, where do we want this thing to fit, to sit horizontally? Right now, this is set to fill. If I set it to center, um, 
film and I set this to center, I get a very small J panel. Right, so fill is going to increase in size as the window gets resized. And this is just a tiny little window that's sitting in the middle. It's actually that little blob right there. That's the border. So we'll we'll play with that more, but let's um, let's just leave these at fill. All right. Well, let's look at a J panel. And there's not a whole lot of methods available for this. Right? There's six methods, none of which really mean much to us. But remember, a J panel is is a component, which is a container, which is a component, which is an object. It's inheriting a bunch of stuff from these other objects. And in particular, it's inheriting a, inheriting a method called paint from a J component. And paint is a method. It returns no argument. It takes a single argument, which is a graphics object. And it says, invoke by swing to draw components. What does that mean? Well, that's that's the whole game right there. So swing, which is sort of just this thing that's that's drawing these objects that we're asking for. We put a button here, so swing is drawing a button and putting the label in the middle and so on and so forth. It's also painting the J panel. And the J panel, you know, it's got a border that we set up, so it looks like it's got a beveled border, it's got a background color, and that's about it. To create all of those aspects of the panel, it's calling a method inside JPanel called paint. And paint by itself doesn't do much. It fills in the background color. It draws a border if we ask for a border. It, it um, puts the title bar on the top if this is a frame and such, but, but it doesn't really do anything. So if we want to draw a little rectangle somewhere in the middle of this panel, we need to do this inside paint. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to override the inherited paint method with our own paint method. And once we have that, that paint method is called sometime by swing, and it's given a graphics object. And we can use that graph graphics object to do things like fill rectangle or draw oval or whatever we want to do. All right, so this is going to be a little quirky. I'm going to delete this panel. I'm going to create a new Java class, and I'm going to call it my panel. And I'm going to say this extends J panel. <coughs> and I'm going to hit Alt Enter to give me the option of importing the class. So now it knows where J panel comes from. And the only thing I'm going to put in my JPanel class is my own version of Paint. It's going to inherit everything else from JPanel, but I'm going to change the version of Paint that gets used. So I'm going to say public void Paint, which takes a graphics argument. It doesn't have to be called G, but that seems to be what everybody calls it. I'm going to hit Alt-Enter to import the graphics class. So it just imported like everything in java.awt. And now we can do whatever painting we want in here. So let's say something like g dot fill rectangle. And let's make a 40 by 40 rectangle at position 20 comma 20. And let's build that. Okay, so I want to put a my panel onto this form here. There's no my panel over here. There's a J panel, but J panel doesn't have our paint method in it. So we're going to come all the way to the bottom. We're going to say non palette component. Click on that, bring it in here, drop it. And now it's going to ask me what class do I want this to be. 
So you can type in my class or you can select it from here. Here's the really important thing. You got to say create binding automatically. I don't know why. But if you don't do that, it doesn't actually give it a name and you can't access it from outside. So it'll work with or without that for now. But later on, we're going to need it to be bound. So check that and say OK. OK, I'm going to change the alignment to be fill again. And in my design window here, you can already see there's my rectangle. Right, so the thing that's showing me what my my dialogue is going to look like is actually looking at the code for my panel and knows that it's going to draw a rectangle right there. And if I add something else here to say, g dot draw oval. Right, and it's it's helping me out here. It's giving me hints for what kinds of arguments I need. Well, I need four integers. They could have used better names. But, um, but it's going to be uh, an x and y center and then an x radius and a y radius, I believe. And if I build this, well, let's just run it. All right, so there's my rectangle, there's my little oval. And there's lots of stuff happening here, right? If I drag this over to the side, and then I drag it back, these things still exist. Well, that doesn't just happen, right? There's no rectangle sitting on this little box, right? This is just stuff that's being drawn by the graphics subsystem. So let me leave you with one thing in here. Inside our paint method, let's just print a message. So we're inside paint right now. Every time that I change the size, <coughs> it hops inside paint. Well, we can't really see this here. But any time that this thing needs to be redrawn because it was covered up by something else, or because it went off the side of the screen, or because it changed size, it's going to call paint. So this is going to be our next challenge, is we don't get to call the paint method. We know that when paint gets called, it's going to draw a rectangle and an oval, but we don't actually get to call paint. All right, swing is calling paint. And we need to sort of understand that difference and know how to work with that. So if we change something, we want this to be displayed. Again, we can't just call paint, but we can call something called repaint. And repaint basically asks Swing to call paint for us, which it may do right away, but it may do in a little bit. So it's a request. And this is a shift in mindset, right? We're working with a system that's already doing a whole bunch of stuff, and we need to kind of work within that framework. Yeah? So is painting kind of like flushing standard out? Basically, yeah, same idea. Um, except with standard out, we could say F flush, and it'll actually flush it. Here we could say, you know, F flush when you get a chance. And it'll tell it that there's something in there that should be flushed out, and it'll schedule it and do it at some point. Yeah, same idea. All right, so we will draw lots of rectangles and ovals and start interacting with things tomorrow. Um, and I may change PA3 from a tic-tac-toe game to a calculator. I haven't decided. I may, I may do something different. All right, I'll see you tomorrow.